Hello and welcome to a special edition of the show. On today's edition of the show, an agreement for compensation has been reached between the federal government and the various parties. On the first part of the show, I'll speak with Globe and Mail reporter Kirsty Kirkup, where she will break down the numbers from today's announcement. Then I'll speak to Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu about the government's perspective and why the government decided the time was now to reach this announcement. And finally, I'll speak with the Executive Director of the Families and Children Caregiving Society, Cindy Blackstock, about what else needs to be done to provide relief to Indigenous peoples, specifically survivors and families. That's all coming up today on The Wyatt Sharp Show. So with the announcement today regarding compensation for survivors and families, joining me now is Kirsty Kirkup, reporter for The Globe and Mail. So Kirsty, maybe you can just start off with just briefly kind of breaking down um, what was announced today, um, some of the details of the compensation as best as you can. I mean, I know it's kind of um, a very big announcement and there's multiple components to it, but just speak about that. Yeah, so essentially we heard details uh, from the federal government and there were also parties that were involved in this case that joined in the news conference. And the big takeaway is that there's a $40 billion commitment from Ottawa, $20 billion for compensation for First Nations children who were unnecessarily taken into the child welfare system, and then another $20 billion committed for long-term reform. Uh, This is called, um, there are actually two agreements in principle, and they're going to have to be finalized. So there's some uh, processes that have to play out um, over the next little while. Uh, But the goal is that this is going to um, be a formal uh, settlement. And uh, in fact, we heard ministers today describing this as the largest settlement in Canadian history. So um, this is a a big moment for the government. They, in fact, have been criticized heavily by opposition parties and advocates all throughout the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case on First Nations child welfare, as well as uh, separate class action lawsuits uh, that they were discriminating against First Nations children. Um, They acknowledged in a statement today that, in fact, they they had uh, done that. And so this is a step, again, to um, remedy uh, that that wrong, uh, although uh, Minister Miller, the Crown Indigenous Relations Minister, recognizing that no amount of money uh, will ever be able to repair the harm that was caused. In terms of eligibility, I know I asked about this at the press conference today in terms of, you know, there's going to be a total of $40 billion of compensation. As you mentioned, it's divided up into two groups of $20 billion. Each will be allocated for different things. But Um, Are there any details as of yet as to um, who the compensation is going to be going to? Because as I mentioned, that's what I asked today. And um, I don't necessarily know if there's direct criteria there. It seemed to be that would be something that they would fully um, finalize and come to an agreement on um, in the coming months. Is that right? Or Yeah, so uh, specifically on compensation, uh, the agreement um, specifically says that this is for First Nations children um, on reserve and in the Yukon who were removed from their homes between the 1st of April 1991 and March 31st of 2022. So we're talking about um, actually um, at at the present time an acknowledgement that there has been, um, again, this harm that has been caused as well, it would apply for parents and and caregivers, so uh, the families of First Nations kids. I will point out that in the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal decision back in 2019, which has really been at the core of this, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, Wyatt, had found that Ottawa uh, recklessly and willfully discriminated against Indigenous children on reserve by failing to provide appropriate funding for child and family services, and it ordered them to provide $40,000 for each First Nations child unnecessarily taken into care um, on or after January 2006. Um, Again, there's different criteria for, again, the the class action lawsuits as well. So there's some nuances to this. uh, But again, specifically the government providing um, some details in terms of um, 
who will be captured uh, by uh, this compensation agreement. And as I say, those details will have to be finalized in the weeks to come. And of course, this information appropriately shared with uh, First Nations uh, families who um, may qualify. We understand uh, some 200,000 uh, may uh, be actually captured uh, by this future settlement. Um, I took out of the press conference today, I believe one of the reporters asked um, when this would come into effect. What I took out of it was that um, it's not necessarily known yet. Um, is there any details as, as to when this when the compensation will actually be given to people? Yeah, it's a really good question because, frankly, I think that's really top of mind uh, for specifically, again, the First Nations families that are at the heart of this story. We don't actually know when that money is going to flow. And that has been a concern that has been articulated by Dr. Cindy Blackstock, the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, saying that, you know, what um, was presented today, of course, it is important uh, to have agreements in principle, but she's saying these are words on paper and that she's going to be measuring results at the level of those First Nations kids. So um, I think the intention is for this uh, to the compensation uh, to flow as soon as possible. But again, there are um, these technicalities that do need to be worked out because agreements in principle, also, especially those that involve legal processes do have to involve, for example, the government going to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and presenting them with um, what, what they have on offer, essentially. And it ensuring that the tribunal um, does believe that they are actually meeting the spirit of the orders that they have put forward. Okay, and finally, how do you think that obviously in the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, Commissioner, do you think that the announcement today will um, better the relationship between Indigenous peoples and, and the government? And, and how do you think that, that now that this announcement has been made, the government will move forward to implement the calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Well, what I would say, Wyatt, is that um, the issue of child welfare was at the top of the list for um, the TRC's calls to action, the 94 calls to action that were issued back in 2015. And there have been experts who have drawn parallels to the residential school system that removed children from their homes and placed them into residential schools with the contemporary um, First Nations child welfare system. How will this uh, ad address the issue of reconciliation? Well, I think, frankly, that the um, case before the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has, um, again, by advocates, uh, been seen as really being out of step with the Liberal government's promise um, on reconciliation with Indigenous people. And this has been a major, major sticking point, frankly, for a number of years. And I think that there, um, especially after the findings of burial sites of uh, the, the unmarked graves that took place, there was kind of a growing awareness amongst Canadians about the, the need to actually actualize reconciliation. And so I really do think that that contributed to the public pressure um, that kind of formed the basis for um, the kind of negotiations that happened uh, leading right up uh, to New Year's Eve. But again, I think the measure of how the government is doing will be based on action because, um, again, people like Dr. Blackstock have said she's not going to be measuring them based on their words or what they're putting in an agreement. She wants to see that um, this discrimination is actually remedied at the level of children. And she says every single Canadian should actually be measuring the government um, on this very issue. What happens to these First Nations children who have been unnecessarily harmed? All right, Christy, thank you for this. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you. I spoke with Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu just after the press conference where she announced the compensation agreement alongside numerous Indigenous leaders, as well as her colleagues, the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti, as well as the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Mark Miller. Here is my interview with the Honourable Patty Haidu, Minister of Indigenous Services for Canada. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the show with the compensation announcement for uh, Indigenous child welfare that just took place. Joining me now to discuss this is the Minister of Indigenous Services, the Honorable Patty Haidu. Minister, let's start out with um, uh, asking you about uh, COVID-19 very briefly, because you did mention in your opening remarks at the press conference um, that COVID-19 in Indigenous communities um, has shown some of the inequities. So speaking a little bit, uh, just firstly, 
about um, what you're doing as minister to ensure that people specifically in Indigenous communities can get access to the tools they need um, to, to fight this pandemic. Well, thanks very much, Wyatt. And yes, of course, um, COVID-19 isn't sparing Indigenous communities as well. And in particular, this uh, this most recent surge of infectious uh, variant Omicron is presenting a challenge for many Indigenous communities across the country. And I think it exacerbates uh, challenges that communities are living with. Uh, for example, uh, lack of affordable housing or crowding, um, challenges with accessing health care. Many communities that are remote uh, rely on uh, um, you know, air delivery of food and, and a variety of other kinds of things that can get disrupted in the case of uh, severe disease outbreaks. So we've been working with individual communities across the country uh, to ensure that they have the resources in place, whether it might be money, uh, additional health human resources, um, in some cases, technical expertise, depending on the nature of the outbreak, and we'll continue to do that. We've uh, uh, already spent about $2 billion in uh, something called the COVID response. Uh, fund for Indigenous communities. It's a self-determined money that communities can access to purchase or pay uh, for the kinds of supports and services they need. Okay, and as it relates to the compensation announcement that just took place, can you just start out by just giving your overall reaction to the announcement uh, for people that necessarily aren't familiar with the announcement that took place and also just explain kind of what it is, explain some of the terms that were used. I know there was a term, uh, Jordan's principle that was used a lot. And um, so for people that don't necessarily understand some of the terms that were used, just maybe explain some of them. Well, absolutely. Um, so this historic agreement is an agreement in principle for the government of Canada, along with First Nations partners, to end the discrimination, and I would say racist funding for Indigenous children in this country that will result in, that has resulted in extraordinary harm for families and communities, children removed from their homes, often because of issues like poverty, lack of support for services, children not being able to access healthcare services in their own communities, and therefore removed to get care in other communities while staying with uh, foster families. There are many, many stories like this across this country. Um, for a very long time, Canada has not provided adequate uh, funding for First Nations communities to have appropriate care within those communities for children. And so this agreement actually changes that and it, and it, and it compensates people who've been harmed by historic underfunding for children and family services, but it also lays the stage and the foundation, including with significant amounts of money to reform child and uh, social services in First Nations communities across this country so that these responses can be First Nations and Indigenous led and children can stay home in their communities and get the services they need so that families can stay intact. The inequity, um, a, a couple of the Indigenous leaders, as well as I believe yourself and Minister Miller mentioned in the press conference about um, some of the inequities that, that people are facing. Um, and I do believe someone brought up um, the idea uh, of childcare and how, um, you know, even right now when, you know, the rest of the country, for example, is, is signing deals with the federal government for childcare, Indigenous peoples are largely um, being left out of these agreements, I believe is what someone pointed out. So can you speak a little bit about um, how this announcement in particular, but just in general helps with, for example, the issue that I described? Well, in terms of the child care agreements, uh, we are working with provinces and territories to ensure that those child care agreements will indeed scope in First Nations communities. And in, in, on top of that, uh, my department, the Indigenous Services Canada, works closely with Indigenous communities to make sure that child care is equitable. We'll make sure that as we move forward with affordable child care across this country, that that will not stop at the gates of Indigenous communities. And in fact, Indigenous communities and Indigenous families will have access to affordable child care because this is a critical ingredient in the government of Canada's plan for future prosperity of the country. And I'll just say that in terms of this um, settlement agreement, um, the $20 billion in reform will go towards First Nations communities um, in ways that they determine are going to be the most useful and helpful to keep families intact, to keep children well and healthy, and to make sure that people have the best chance to succeed, including um, making sure that families have the kinds of 
supports they need. I can anticipate there might be, for example, um, supports for respite care if a child has significant disabilities, other kinds of um, supports for child care that might be uh, necessary in particular circumstances. But of course, those details are details that Indigenous communities will be working out with their partners as they work to reform the services uh, with the support of the department that I'm responsible for. And as it relates to the um, announcement today, there was uh, $20 billion announced for uh, that would be allocated for survivors and families. And then I believe it was $20 billion um, for what um, you and the other people there today called reforming the system. So can you speak a little bit about um, and just um, more than what you said in the press conference about um, specifically where this money will be allocated for, who's going to be receiving the money and how much these people will receive? Well, you're right, Wyatt. There's two buckets of money in this. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm hearing my Skype call. Um, there's two buckets of money involved in the in the uh, in the settlement, and one bucket is to um, provide some restitution to individuals that were harmed as a result of discriminatory practices that that resulted in them being removed from home or not getting the kinds of care that they needed and that they deserved. Um, that money uh, is roughly twenty billion dollars. It will be distributed with the leadership of Indigenous uh, communities and leaders who are going to help make sure that it gets distributed properly and safely to uh, survivors. There'll be more details available in the months to come. Uh, the second bucket of $20 billion is there to uh, support, as we've talked about, the, refor the reformation of uh, Indigenous and children um, children's services across the, uh, across the country in First Nations communities, where children um, have not had the same kinds of opportunities to succeed, where, in fact, many of them have been removed from families, uh, sometimes simply for reasons of poverty or other kinds of um, situations that families were, were not able to control. And that is, I, to me, um, a very, very important component of this agreement is making sure this doesn't happen to families in the future. Okay, and just one final question. Can you speak a little bit too about, um, obviously, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner put out um, calls to action a little while ago now? Can you speak a little bit about um, you just provide an update on, on the calls to action specifically, even if you look at um, clean drinking water, there's lots of uh, parts in northern Ontario and specifically in Nunavut and in Iqaluit right now where they're facing issues with uh, clean drinking water. So can you just speak a little bit about that? Well, absolutely. And that's actually been some of the primary work of uh, the government of Canada under the leadership of Justin Trudeau has been to lift those long term water boil, the long term uh, boil water advisories that have numbered in, you know, the hundreds when we took uh, when we took office in 2015. And now we're down to just over 35 long term boil water advisories, um, with more being lifted in the months to come. These are, uh, you know, long standing injustices, um, oftentimes, Times challenging locations that have, you know, presented significant challenges, but nonetheless are surmountable. And so we continue to work with the communities that are affected to make sure that we have um, not just the appropriate resources in place to purchase the equipment and the kinds of water treatment plants that are necessary, but to make sure that people have training and that there's a long-term plan to sustaining um, those plants and making sure that they fit within the infrastructure of a community and they can grow with the infrastructure of the community as these communities grow. I've learned a lot about water over the last number of years, and I will say that I am confident that we'll be able to lift the remaining long-term boil water advisories, but we will work with each individual community to make sure we understand their needs and how we can best do that as quickly as possible. I think everybody wants to see this get done. All right, Minister. Well, thank you so much for joining me and for uh, coming on on short notice. I know we kind of just organized this last night, but uh, yeah, thank you for coming on and helping to explain uh, the announcement today. Thank you very much, Wyatt. Best of luck. Thank you. Now, Sydney Blackstock, the executive director of the Family and Children Caregiving Society, played a big role in today's announcement, and so here's my interview with her. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show with the compensation announcement today between the federal government and the various parties. Joining me now to discuss this is Sydney Blackstock, who is the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caregiving Society. Um, I guess I'll just start out with your general reaction to the announcement. 
uh, that took place and also maybe just explain a little bit um, about whether or not you think that the funding that has been provided, the compensation that's been provided is enough funding? Now, those are really good questions. Just as a bit of background for your viewers, is that at, at the issue at this case is that the federal government funds First Nations Children's Services, whereas the provinces does for everybody else. And since Confederation, they've given a lot less money for these things. And what that's meant for First Nations families is that they have the trauma residential schools, but with fewer support services to deal with it. So when we filed this case in 2007, along with the Assembly of First Nations, there were more children in child welfare care than at the height of residential schools. So we needed to get the support services in place to address that kind of inequality and help families stay together. Back then, had the government of Canada implemented the solution, it would have been hundreds of millions of dollars to fix. Now, because so many children were hurt and the trauma deepened for so many families, we're talking about tens of billions. So there's the compensation, which is to uh, address the children, and there's still children in many cases, and young people, and young adults who are hurt by Canada. That'll, that'll be $40,000, hopefully, as a floor, and then more from that, but you'll never get that childhood back. And then there's the important work of ending that inequality and making sure this is the last generation of First Nations kids that's hurt by the government of Canada. In many ways, that's the most challenging and the most important part of this work. And that was one of the questions that one of the ministers was asked today by one of the reporters who phoned in was, you know, how can we make sure that this is the last generation, uh, generation of children that um, this happens to? So in your view, what can be done to make sure that that does happen? Well, I think one of the things we need to look for is the government actually accepting responsibility for what it did. You know, Wyatt, up until recently, the government was blaming the child welfare system. They was blaming everyone other than accepting responsibility for its own discriminatory conduct. On a positive news, they've now said that the discrimination is ongoing, but that's not enough. We need to have independent experts looking at the department itself. Why is it that in 2022, it still was, uh, had took legal orders and significant public pressure to get it to fund First Nations children equitably. And this $20 billion to reform the system, that just tells us how deep that inequality really was, right? Um, so we need the government to learn from that and to have an independent evaluation to point out where the flaws are in its thinking that stops it from doing better when it knows better for First Nations kids. So that's absolutely key. When you look at the actual funding that was announced today, it was $20 billion for, I believe it was survivors and, and families, uh, and then $20 billion, as you just mentioned, um, to try and reform the system. But is it known as of right now and has, have, has an agreement been reached as to, you know, the eligibility of this program, who's going to uh, receive funding? Because obviously it is a lot of money. It's nearly $40 billion. But is it enough for every First Nations child who has you know, faced abuse to, to receive compensation? It's an open question, I think. Um, we need to get a better sense of how many victims there are out there. Unfortunately, the government of Canada didn't keep good data on how many children we're talking about. I can just say from 2006 to about 2019, we're talking at about 57 to 60,000 young people. Now think about that, Wyatt. That's about the size of uh, as many of the larger cities, like Fredericton is about that population. Imagine all those people going into child welfare care because they got less supports for their families and other kids got. But those are just the numbers we're working with. There may be additional children. So we need to make sure that the goal is to compensate everyone fairly no matter what that ends up being as a tally, and then also to do the important work of ensuring that this is the last generation of kids who's discriminated against. I think that $20 billion that they have for reform will go some significant difference to addressing it, but it might take more because the inequalities are that deep. You mentioned that there could be more people who are, um, who uh, like on top of the amount of people that you mentioned. So um, how can you move forward without knowing the full amount of people that, that have faced abuse and who are going to receive compensation? Well, I think what we do is we say, uh, we, you know, we can identify who we can identify. And then we have to do the important public education work to say, if you experience this, please come forward because you may be entitled to compensation. 
And uh, that important work needs to happen. And also really critical, Wyatt, is being able to distribute this in a safe way. So we've talked to First Nations young people in care and the types of things that they're looking for out of compensation are mental health supports, um, supports with financial literacy, um, supports uh, in terms of uh, community connections, all of that stuff has to go as a package. Okay, and I'll ask you too about the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner, because obviously this is a step forward, but there's still many communities who don't have access to, let's say, for example, clean drinking water. When we look at, um, well, I'll give an example of a Calouette in Nunavut and just more broadly the territory of Nunavut, um, who, you know, their Indigenous communities face challenges with clean drinking water on its own. And then right now, a large percentage of their water, according to the mayor of a Calouette, is contaminated. Um, so, I mean, how can we um, ensure that the government and what are you going to do in your role to ensure that the government take some of the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner and actually acts on those calls to action? Yeah, like it's taken us litigation and public pressure to get movement on this. It shouldn't take that, right? When the government is looking at a problem, such as uh, Inuit children in Nunavut being deprived proper drinking water, it ought to be really acting ASAP to fix that situation. Um, I think the real answer is public accountability. I think that's why things change for us, is that with the affirmation of the children in unmarked graves, the Canadians started paying attention and they started being more curious about what is happening right now. And then asking their members of parliament, like why are the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, calls to action not being implemented? What are you doing about this? We need to see that same kind of pressure and dialogue continue because governments don't necessarily create change, they respond to change. And that's the answer. And when you look, obviously the announcement took place today but when you look at you know is, when is this going to um, come into effect how much longer are people going to have to to wait because there's many people who as you mentioned previously are having mental health challenges there's people who um, don't have access to clean drinking water there's people who don't have access to basically life essentials that you need in order to survive on an indigenous land reserve yeah, well, this case will not deal with drinking water. It will not deal with the inequalities in education. So I think the opportunity there for the public is to get a hold of your member of parliament and say, look, we saw this, but this just shows us how unjust the other inequalities are in education, in water. You need to start moving on those because it's a lot. You either pay now or you pay a lot later. And the worry about later is it's often children's lives that are lost or hurt in the heart in the, in the delay. So we have to press for that. I think the other piece that we need to think seriously about is uh, the importance of using litigation uh, for the government when it won't move on these things for precisely the reason that you're talking about, Wyatt. Children only have one childhood. Equality for children should come in a leap, not in a shuffle. And if it takes litigation to get us there, then let's do it. But let's not stand by and let another generation of Indigenous kids be hurt by the government unnecessarily. Okay, Ms. Blackstock, well, that was my final question. So thank you for joining me and uh, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you for having me, Wyatt.